You know, the first question I'd ask is, uh, how many of you are founders in the audience who are um, either sort of contemplating moving to the U.S. or perhaps want to at least snag some capital from a U.S.-based VC? Okay, so a decent some. amount. There are a few of you. Yeah. <laughs> that's Great. all? What, what are the rest of you doing? <laughs> They're all out there. Yeah, oh, that's right. They're all pitching. That's true. Yeah. That's true. That's a good point. Well, hopefully you'll find this uh, discussion instructive nevertheless. Um, we're going to be talking today about what's happening in Silicon Valley. Uh, and then we're going to be talking about what these guys think about Europe and, and how they view sort of European-based uh, founders. Um, so David, let's start with you. Sure. <laughs> I guess the big question, as ever, is, you know, is there just a giant bubble building in <laughs> Silicon Valley? Or is there a, like a fundamental misunderstanding about what companies are worth today, given how fast they're growing? Yes and no. I mean, there isn't a fundamental misunderstanding. The reality is it's a marketplace, right? At the end of the day, valuations in Silicon Valley are driven by the market for these amazing opportunities. And so, People have seen things that have outperformed wildly, right? The, you know, no one, no one anticipated a business that could go public at $100 billion until Facebook did it, right. right? And now, as we have other businesses like Airbnb and Uber that are marching towards that price, $25, $50 billion in private valuations, you know, they're sort of looking, saying, gee, is there an opportunity to build the next tentpole business that's going to that's gonna produce incredible value, not just in the business itself, but in these offshoots and the access and value that sort of uh, accumulates around it, right? And so, so meanwhile, Facebook goes from 100 billion to 200 billion, and, uh, and so I think that their investors sort of look at these things and say, wow, there's a huge opportunity here to get in at the ground floor of things that will be, you know, that will be institutions for for decades to come. Right. Um, now, that said, they can't all be that, <laughs> right? There are going to be a handful of those, and in fact, there are going to be 10 or 15 of those every decade, right? And so, uh, so a lot of these investments are not going to work. Uh, there are lots of investments, and we're already seeing some of that uh, happen, where you know, things that got done at billions of dollars are sort of looking like they're maybe worth millions of dollars. Right. And so people are reconsidering. And so, you know, it's a dynamic environment. I think we're already seeing valuations start to, uh, to deflate a little. Well, so speaking of deflating valuations, um, maybe Andy, I'd be interested in your take on this. You're, you're investing at the earlier stages of things, but we're all sort of concerned with the broader picture. Um, I'm sure, hopefully, you're following some of this, but back in the States, um, some sort of um, non-traditional uh, private stage investors like BlackRock and uh, Fidelity, uh, the mutual fund company, have been uh, sort of helping um, inflate the valuations of these companies, and now they're very publicly marking some of them down, and then some of them back up a little bit, but not all the way. Um, is, this, is this going to have sort of meaningful ripple effects, do you think, or do you think it's going to be forgotten by January? You know, I think it will, but I think it's going to take time. Um, you know, what we're already seeing is these later stage wobbles affecting the C rounds, the B rounds, and actually now the A rounds. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got great companies who, you know, are frankly struggling to raise at a valuation pot based on what they, la they raised the last round at. So what we're trying to do is be more conservative about the valuations that we place on the companies when we fund them. Because what we want to be able to see is, you know, you go from raising your A at X and your B at Y and show a meaningful progression as you move through the stages. And frankly, when you have a company with almost zero revenue going out at like a $20 million post because it was super hot, that doesn't really do anybody any good. It's bad for the company, it's bad for the investors, and frankly, it's bad for everybody else who looks around and says, like, holy shit, you know, this company did that, why can't we? And I think that's the cycle that we've seen ourselves going through over the last two or three years, and I think it's kind of on everybody involved, both on the investor side, actually, and on the entrepreneur side, to try and rein in that enthusiasm. We talk about a bubble and a bubble bursting, but it's not going to burst, it's just going to contract. Mm -hmm. And that's really the natural order of things. You know, the economy goes up and down, we're seeing a bit of slowdown now, and it will take time, but it will move back up again in the future. I, uh, I moderated a panel last week in San Francisco, and I talked to a lot of early stage investors who said, in fact, uh, a lot of their portfolio companies are being told, you know, they're looking for follow on funding, and their portfolio companies are being told, let's just wait and see what happens. Uh, Tomas, you run a popular accelerator, AngelPad. You just graduated 13 companies from that uh, newest class. How is their experience right now out in the market compared to maybe the class that you graduated earlier this year? 
so, so I want to actually talk about the valuations for one second. Oh, okay, in, sure. in, with, with the same answer, though, um, or the same question. Um, you know, Bastian was just out here from Postmates, and uh, you know, his, his first valuation uh, coming out in 2010 uh, was $5 million, basically with an idea. And that actually hasn't changed that much from what it is today in, in the early stage seed. You know, you, you see valuations kind of from four to maybe $8 million, um, this is pre-money. And so in the really early stage, not that much has changed from three, four years ago. Certainly from five, six, seven years ago, it has dramatically changed. Um, you know, the fundraising climate right now in the US or in Silicon Valley specifically, you know, it's a, it's a good place to be. It's, uh, you know, it's, there's a lot of money, there's a lot of investors, but there's also a lot of, um, you know, new investors. And the newer investors, the newer funds, are um, always looking for others to kind of, you know, lead. And, and not lead necessarily as lead investors, but lead the way. You know, oh, so-and-so has committed, and all of a sudden everyone else is committing. You know, getting this, this commitment for the first 500K in a seed round certainly is the hardest one. After that, it just balloons, and it quickly goes from, you know, 1.5 to 2, to even more than that. Um, so you're, you're saying the investors are basically lemmings? Uh, absolutely, <laughs> yes. <laughs> not, not you two, what though. What a shot. <laughs> But well, I think SoftTech is actually a, an exception to that because you make an independent decision irregardless and you're one of the signals. And, and once you invest, you know everyone is, wants to pile on. Yeah, you know, we, if we find a company we love, we want to lead it um, and we want to build a great syndicate of other investors to come in alongside us. And then, you know, we want to get them to the point where we can help them raise a really killer A. Well, not to make this sound like a crazy circle jerk, but with a great fund like August. Oh. <laughs> 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 I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's true, I, I think, you know, in the, in the earliest stage, um, you know, the, the hardest part is, it, it, you know, certainly it's money, and, and for every investor that is out there pitching right now, what's on their mind is money. But the second part really is the person behind it. And, um, you know, when you, when you have all these investors that make a lot of investments, you know, dozens and dozens a year, or even more than that, um, you have to ask yourself as a founder, what support do I get with it? Um, is it really just money? And, and sometimes money is good, just money is fine. Um, but if you do have the chance to work with a great investor, I, th I, think, I think that, you know, that's really when it comes together. And that's when those, those rounds balloon, because someone is like, oh, there's a great investor involved with a lot of money. Right. You know, my money is really safe on top of that. And boom, you have, you know, a big valuation. Um, before we move on to uh, what's happening in Europe and how you sort of uh, view the scene here, just quickly, what do you think is going to happen in the U.S. in 2016? I mean, my own suspicion, which I'm sure is sort of not so unusual, is we're going to see more IPOs, more M&A. It just seems like there's a lot of pressure built into uh, the environment at this point uh, with so many, you know, 150, 170 uh, companies that are worth a billion dollars, uh, you know, on paper to their investors that have not exited yet. What do you yeah, I mean, one of the problems with the valuation, you know, this valuation bubble that you're describing is that actually it's working against what you just suggested, right? It's working against M&A, it's working against IPOs, right? right? You look at the recent uh, Square IPO. I mean, they needed to go public because they were losing a lot of money. They actually needed the capital. And yet, they had to go public at half of the valuation that they raised money at last in the private markets, right? That's a very hard thing to do, and you only do it if you kind of are in a position where you, you need to, to right? right? right. Um, and so we have lots and lots of companies that are at very big valuations. They, they need a lot of runway to, to get the economics of their business to match the valuation for the company from a public market standpoint. And then from a private, from, a, from, a, from an M&A standpoint, it's even harder, right? Because you have these companies that need to justify the acquisition of the company, but they're being valued at $2 billion, $4 billion, and, and the acquirers are looking at saying, there's no way I can buy you for $2 billion. So if you're willing to take a billion, then I might have a conversation, or more, or more like, you're willing to take $400 million, I'm willing to have a conversation. And so um, I think actually what we're going to need to see is a reasonable downturn before there's any real uptick in, in M&A in particular. Um, and so I think we'll continue to see some great companies that have the opportunity to go public. Mm -hmm. um, but, but this has been one of the slowest tech IPO years in, in, in recent history, uh, despite every enthusiasm for the market. Right. Um, so it's this very interesting dichotomy of incredible enthusiasm in the private markets and real skepticism in the public markets. It almost seems like right. the downturn is going to happen on the public markets. I mean, and maybe you know, eventually they'll surpass their current valuations, but it seems like that's the only way we're going to sort of really I see what these 2016 is going to be interesting. You know, 2016, 
it's the first time in what eight years that the interest rates are going to be raised um, in 2016 right. if it doesn't even happen before um, it's an election year with a change of administration in the US so for sure we're going to have some different policies so like the macroeconomics around it there's always uncertainty when that happens um, you know and, and uncertainty goes both ways you know in 2008 um, as Obama came in there was a lot of uncertainty, obviously, but there was a lot of hope that things are going to be turned around, right? And, and I, don't know what the, I don't know what the sentiment in the real world is. I can tell you in Silicon Valley in New York. Um, but there will be changes, and I, I, think, I think the markets could go both ways. They could be, start being very optimistic, and we're going to have, I don't know, a Donald Trump crazy uh, a president, or you know, we might have a Hillary Clinton <laughs> uh, you know, female president. Like, you, know, I, you really don't know how, how the markets react to it. But it's going to be an interesting year for sure, 2016. It's going to be a lot more interesting than 2015, <laughs> I think, um, just from the public side. Yeah, absolutely. Andy, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a firm believer in you know, great companies will always do well. Now, we're advising all of our businesses to kind of tighten their belts slightly, you know, make sure that they're on top of spend, make sure that they are keeping track of, you know, just not doing anything stupid. And I think you know, my focus has always been on B2B, and it's much easier to do that with a B2B company. You can begin to calculate what their lifetime value and their customer acquisition cost is. And we know that companies with great metrics can go out and raise cash. But we also know that companies don't have great metrics immediately, so they need to trim, trim their spend. You know, and the, the funding will come back. And to these guys' point, there is a lot of money sloshing around. However, right. I just think that in, you know, unless you need to raise money, you probably shouldn't immediately. Uh, given what's happening in the US, which is a little bit crazy and unpredictable, um, how are you viewing you know, what's happening here? Is it, are you paying more attention than you have in the past? Are you spending more time here or not necessarily? Well, I mean, you know, for me, as you can tell from the accent, this is my, right, my right. hometown, so it's <laughs> nice to be back. Um, yeah, you know, we, one of the things I loved about Softtake when, when I was getting to know them last year was that they have a, a really strong focus on kind of non-traditional entrepreneurs. We have a ton of Europeans, a ton of people from all over the world, and, you know, they have come through Y Combinator, they maybe come through AngelPad or 500 Startups or Techstars, but, you know, really, we don't care where the founders come from. We don't care what the founding team looks like as long as they're exceptional. So for me, you know, this is a great excuse to come meet the great companies here in, in the UK, and, you know, and it feels kind of weird to say, you know, get them to move out to the US, but frankly, that's kind of my job now, so, you know, <laughs> if people are looking for money and they are thinking about, about, you know, moving out to the valley, then please do come and find me. I'm going to be here for the next couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a harder case to make? I, I'm starting to get the feeling that there's not the urgency that there once was to come to the US. Um, maybe it's because things are so expensive and... You well, know. you know, I'm, I, I'm a, I, again, you know, I've, I have some pretty firm beliefs about a lot of these things, and I think that not every business needs to be in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. If you're building kind of, you know, again, going on the B2B side, if you're building vertical SaaS for finance or for legal or for advertising or for fashion or for music, there's a billion places in the world but to be, you know, better to be than Silicon Valley, because frankly, music and fashion really don't exist there. Um, but you know, if you're doing those things, London is an incredible place to start the business. Now, you may need to spend more time in the US in the future when you're going out to raise that big growth round. But frankly, you should be where your customers are. And if your customers are here, this is where you should be building your business. Tomas, do you agree? You know, I love European founders. You know, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. You wrote about it in TechCrunch. Um, you know, we've had a lot of success with three European founders. Um, you know, we had you know, Postmates European founders, Vongolis European founders, Rollpoint is European founders. But um, they've all come to the US. Do and they've, they all need, come, yeah. they've all come. So European founders meaning, you know, European educated came over, not second or third generation uh, European. And, um, you know, uh, there is something about the people that, you know, you know, pick up their bag and get over there and figure it out over there that is, that is unique. And, and we've, we really have seen a lot of success um, uh, with those founders. I think what's different, you know, today than, you know, let's say, even three years ago, certainly beyond, b before that, is what Bastian said. You know, he couldn't, he couldn't you know, build a company he wanted to build in the UK. Um, he couldn't raise money for it. Uh, he couldn't get the acceptance. You know, on the other hand, you now have um, Deliveroo, who's, who's going to be on stage later as well. And, uh, and he's built a phenomenal business, you know, being American in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and and you can, so you can kind of switch this around. I think as a founder, you have to... Uh, you just have to know what you want to do. And do you want to cater to a European audience? Do you want to start in Europe, then go to the US, which is a very hard path, make, building a big company, then moving over? Or do you start in Europe, and then you take over all the adjacent part around Europe um, um, that most American companies don't look at? No one looks at, I don't know, Istanbul, um, but that there's a pretty big Turkish population. Certainly no one looks at the Middle East, which is a, you know, a short flight from here compared to New York. So I think you can, you can build 
multi-billion dollar companies anywhere in the world right now. Having said all of that, um, just, like, <laughs> just like Andy, um, for me to work with somebody, I want them in Silicon Valley or in New York. Um, and it's probably purely selfish because I want to work with the founders and if they're not there, I can't work with them. Right. Well, you have the luxury of living in both places. Um, for, for the founders in the audience and in that room uh, beyond us uh, who are thinking about coming, does it matter if they go to New York or Silicon Valley? I mean, New York is closer. Silicon Valley seems to be the place to be. I think they're very different, to tell you the truth. And, uh, but, you know, in the end, what we're trying to find is amazing people to build these companies. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, yeah, proximity to market is helpful and all of these things. But in the end, what you need to big build is a great team that can address your business. Right. So, you know, the, the beauty of a New York, if you're <clears throat> working in financial markets, is there are people who have the domain expertise that they can bring to bear, the beauty of, you know, of, of LA for entertainment, et cetera. But, but in the end, most of these companies that I'm funding and you guys are funding are technology companies and they require technology expertise. Mm -hmm. And there is no better place in the world for technology expertise than Silicon Valley. Right. And so uh, it's this inc incredible problem, which is, the best talent exists, but the greatest demand for that talent exists, and therefore it does get expensive, it does become competitive. Um, but, but my experience is that these amazing companies find their way to Silicon Valley, find their way to the best talent, the talent understands which companies are exciting, uh, they get involved and, they, and, and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Those companies become better, they become more exciting for next set of great entrepreneurs. And, uh, and so, Ultimately, I think that's the draw. I think that's a draw to European founders who say, I have a good core team, I really are do outperforming. Mm -hmm. Now I want to bring in that next level of marketing and sales, of, of, of technology leadership, et cetera. You know, where, it, where is the greatest density of that? Well, it's going to be in all likelihood Silicon Valley. It might be in New York, it could be in other places. Um, but that is the draw to, to the Bay Area. Um, I, I guess in terms of actually like landing in either place, uh, one, easy, great way is through an accelerator program like AngelPad, where you have, you know, you make friends, you have access to great mentors, you get capital. Um, obviously, not everyone is accepted into accelerator programs. Um, maybe, Andy, I don't know if you have any thoughts about this, having, you know, come there yourself, but how, what's another way to sort of establish a network? I, I, you know, obviously having a good technology is uh, attractive and word spreads fast, but I mean, yeah, I, mean, I think speaking. nothing really beats kind of being there and being on the street. So with Huddle, we, um, we were probably 40 people by the time I, I went out to the US and, you know, I'd been there a bunch over the kind of prior years. I got to know people. I found office space with a friend. They introduced me to people. We then took more office space. We started hiring. And you know, I don't think there's any right or wrong way to, kind of to, to get your business to where you want it to be. You kind of just do what feels right and hope that you don't mess up too much. Um, you know, and, and I've seen companies who have kept engineering in London or engineering in Europe and have moved the, moved the business side over. I know people that have, that have started in the Bay Area. And, then, and Bugsnag is a great example, started by two Brits took their A round from um, Benchmark earlier this year, and they've actually just set up an outsourced development office in Bath, of all places, because that's where they, they went to university, and they've got like a ton of friends there, great engineering school as well. So, you know, there's no one recipe for how to do this right. It's just, uh, you know, you do what, you know, do what makes sense, and, um, and, you know, try not to fuck up too much. <laughs> Tomas, do you have any... Uh... I think it's, you know, it's easy these days. I mean, you get on a plane, you fly over there, um, you know, there's a, there's a meetup, uh, there's 10 meetups every day. Um, there is disrupt. There is, you know, a ton of conferences. I mean, you can you can walk you, you walk into the Creamery on Fourth uh, on Fourth Street, and and you'll probably find three investors sitting there every morning, right? That's right. I used to sit there and just you know meet people. So I think it's easy. San Francisco is an easy city to land, much much easier than New York because in New York you have to find the people that are in technology. If you go to San Francisco, everybody you talk to is going to wear a T-shirt that says Twitter or whatever, and you say, hey, you work at Twitter, cool. What do you do there? You know, and 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 you try to hire them or something. Um, so <laughs> I, th I think it's, it's actually easier um, today than it was ever before to get in a plane, get over there, um, get, you know, rent a cheap Airbnb and be there for a month and see what happens. Um, so I, I think that's, 
that's the spirit you have to have as a founder. Like, right. you know, and you, I, I think, you know, to, to that point, the, you know, the network of Europeans in the Bay Area is so strong that's now. Very true. Everybody knows somebody. You know, you go over there. And you Andy say, invites hey. all the Brits to drink, so <laughs> just find him. <laughs> you know, you, you, you know, hook up with people that you know there, you know, go out with them. They'll yeah. introduce you to somebody. And one of the things I loved about going to San Francisco was just the spirit of paying it forward. You know, the, the social capital of introducing people to your friends. You know, everybody will connect you to somebody else. And, you know, if you want to get to Sir Michael Moritz, you can probably do it through two or three connections once you land. Which is also, possible. let me just take the flip side on that. So, so everything I've said is true, but the flip side on this is that everybody knows an investor and everybody wants to introduce you to somebody. Mm -hmm. um, and you get, you know, you guys get a lot of introductions, you know, from founders and, and the quality of introduction varies by who introduces. So it's also easy to get carried away and, and feel like you're really connected, mm -hmm. but you're still you know, two degrees away from, from the people that either write the checks or, or, or are really good. You know, there's, there's a lot of posturing in Silicon Valley. I think about, oh, I'm a founder, I had a company. It's like, well, you know, how successful was it? You know, just because you started a company and failed after spending a million or two doesn't make you a great founder, right? Doesn't right. make you a great intro to the investor whose money you've lost. Right. Um, so, so I think that's the, the caveat of the easy access is that everybody's going to help you and you have to figure out yourself um, you know, which are the people that you, that you tie yourself to. We, in, I mean, to that point, and I, and I wrote it, I have a blog called Venture Blog, which I need to write more often, I apologize. Uh, but I wrote a post about this a while ago where I described exactly what you're saying, which is, you know, say, well, how do you get to investor? Well, you get to an investor through an introduction, but how strong that introduction is matters, not just how close your relationship is with the, with the person making the introduction, but how close the relationship is between the person making the introduction and the investor, right? Yeah. And so the, you actually have to know these people. They actually have to be excited about you as entrepreneurs. They have to be excited about what you're building so that they can then represent to someone like us, hey, this is someone I think is smart, is, a, is approaching this in a rational way. And by, and by the way, you and I have a good relationship, so you know that I have reasonable judgment, right? right. So. It isn't, it isn't just about, hey, why don't you just introduce me and this will get done. It's, why don't you understand what I'm doing and get excited about it first mm -hmm. so that when the introduction comes in, it, it feels like a real introduction. Because I can tell you there's a huge difference between some introductions I get, David meet so-and-so, and David, I'd like you to meet so-and-so who's an amazing entrepreneur with whom I have, w have worked or would love to work or I'm investing or whatever, right? right. Those things are very different. And yeah. so you, you, you really have to understand that the, the nature of the relationship, not just that you have one. Right, right. But, but I think there's more, you know, there's better data on that than ever before. Like AngelList is an incredible source of information to work out who's connected to whom, you know, who has invested with whom in the past. You know, and that's data that you can leverage to help get that really good quality introduction. Because you're right, you know, we get dozens a day, most of which are crap, but it's the, the two or three from people you genuinely trust who are genuinely excited about the company. Those are the ones that you jump on. Guys, we are running out of time. And before we go, uh, because I think people in the audience want to know what you're sort of interested in, uh, maybe you could each talk about kind of the most interesting new trend that you're tracking. Uh, David, do you mind starting? I, I should not start because I don't track trends. Let, <laughs> okay. I'll let you guys start and I'll just go, yeah, that's good. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> um, so, so I, you know, we invest so broadly, we work with so many companies um, that we don't look for something specific. Uh, we actually look for very, very broad. Um, within one cohort, we don't want to have competing companies. We don't even want competing companies in the portfolio and we have 140 companies that came out of AngelPad now, 130. Um, so we do look very broadly. Um, I, know, I know a few things that I, I don't look at, uh, which is generally hardware, music, and, and dating, because I just don't feel like I can add a lot of value in it. But what I'm really excited about is traditional industries being disrupted um, by technology, um, on the, on the, a lot on the consumer side, but even on the B2B side. So you know, when I look at, you know, certainly black cars have been disrupted, we've seen that. Delivery has been disrupted. Um, there's like you know, 20 others that haven't been disrupted. And, and um, a lot of that has to do about where individuals spend their money. So when you look at how much people spend in their house, for example, on, on water filters and all this other stuff, no, no one really has looked into that. Amazon is actually playing around in that, that field a lot more than any startup. That's on the consumer side. On the enterprise side, I think anything that is enabling um, big data, anything that's enabling APIs, anything that makes all this massive amount of data that, that we're, we, we, we collect and gather, more useful, more sortable, more storable, um, all these really hard technology problems. Um, it's just going to be the plumbing of the gold rush. That's the genes, you know, the Levi's genes of the gold rush is, is the plumbing behind it. And 
you know, Levi's made money, so I figure we make money with uh, investing in some of the plumbing of the internet. <laughs> yeah, so very briefly, kind of similar. I love developer tools. You know, we kind of talk about, you know, funding the guys with the shovels rather than the, uh, the miners. Um, verticalized SaaS, so SaaS for deeply unsexy traditional industries like blue collar technology, government, education, we love all that kind of stuff. Really anything that has been traditionally criminally underserved by technology, we think there's a huge opportunity there. As a fund though, we do marketplaces and hardware and all the same crap as everybody else. Yeah. Well, you, you, said, you said, oh, okay, well, I, actually we're almost out of time. Guys, great to see all of you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank Dennis. You. Yeah.